Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, also from my side to this working session on strategic uh, sovereignty. Uh, within the overall topic uh, of uh, this Jubilee uh, Congress of the Academy of European Law on, uh, as it labeled, uh, <coughs> European sovereignty, the legal dimension, a union in control of its destiny, of its own destiny. Let me give a, a very short uh, introduction. This is not a warning. Uh, if a speaker says he uh, will do something in a short way, then uh, you are aware it will be long. No, uh, I really will stick to a short introduction to our agenda this morning. Um, the general term, uh, strategic uh, sovereignty, uh, the link to the European Union, and of course today's uh, timetable. Um, <clears throat> one word uh, concerning the general term, strategic sovereignty. Uh, what is meant by this wording? And there might be different understandings. Uh, I understand uh, strategic sovereignty as a willingness and the capacity to continuously upholding the self-defined concept of living in relation to others. Now, you are aware that strategic sovereignty, in general, has many prerequisites. First, for the self-defined concept, the spiritual prerequisites of self-determination and intellectual clarity. Second, for the willingness, the mental virtues of political decisiveness and moral persistence. And third, for the capacity, the factual requirements of internal social support of such a strategy, then the economic resources, the diplomatic skills, and after all, also effective military defense capabilities. This was the very general introduction. Now, the link to the European Union. The just mentioned prerequisites imply for the idea of strategic sovereignty uh, of the European uh, Union as a transnational uh, polity of different <coughs> cultures based on law and bound by law and acting by law, uh, but also by other means, Manifold specific challenges are implied. Uh, for the self-defined concept and sovereign willingness of living in relation uh, to others, it might be remembered, because we are here at the Academy for European Law, that the Union is bound by its own constitution, primary law, by Article 3, Paragraph 5, Treaty on European Union, and now I quote, in its relations with the wider world to uphold and promote its values and interests and contribute to the protection of its citizens. It shall contribute to peace, security, the sustainable development of the earth, solidarity and mutual respect among peoples, free and fair trade, eradication of poverty and the protection of human rights. And even more, and I would say ambitious, Article 21, paragraph 1, prescribes, and I quote again, the Union's action on the international scene shall be guided by the principles which have inspired its own creation, development, and enlargement, and which it seeks to advance in the wider world, democracy, the rule of law, the universality and indivisibility of human rights and fundamental freedoms, respect for human dignity, the principles of equality and solidarity, and respect for the principles of the United Nations Charter and international law. Quotation ends. And more specific aims are listed for a special relationship with neighboring countries in Article 8 of the Treaty on European Union. So this is a lot of uh, uh, constitutional law in the sense of primary law. These abstract guidelines require 
the concretization of sub-strategy. For example, towards the surrounding areas, the Mediterranean, uh, there is a strategy, at least on the paper, uh, the Balkans, and the very east of Europe. And currently, uh, the question is at hand as to whether the orient this orientation, uh, this constitution orientation, can and should include, for example, a sub-strategy of the Union and perhaps this might be provocative, what I'm going to say now, to transform Russia's autocratic system of power into an order that is not threatening the Union and its member states, as most recently proposed by Alexei Navalny in the Frankfurter Allgemeine. It's just five or six days ago. Now, for exploring the willingness and the capacity to continuously upholding the self-defined concept, this working session will concentrate in particular on three dimensions of the specific challenges to the willingness and capacity of the Union. Energy, trade and development assistance, defense. And it will also concentrate on the more general political aspects of strategic sovereignty. The aspects of digital and budgetary sovereignty are dealt with in the two other uh, working uh, sessions. So uh, if somebody is more interested in the digital uh, sovereignty, um, then uh, there is another group uh, working uh, in depth uh, with this topic. Our guiding question here in our session can be, could be, under what factual and legal conditions can strategic sovereignty of the Union be realized in these areas, if at all? And the last remark, introductory remark, today's timetable. Our session will be divided into three parts. First, from now until 10 o'clock, we listen to the keynote address on the topic strategic sovereignty of the Union, realistic chance or wishful thinking. And as far as time allows uh, until 10 o'clock, uh, but uh, uh, I'm sure there will not be too much uh, time and uh, we would not be happy if our keynote uh, speaker just uh, shortens himself to uh, 15 minutes. But if there is uh, still uh, a realistic, uh, 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 yes, a realistic um, uh, uh, time, mm -hmm. uh, then first reactions from you. Uh, after uh, a break at 10.30, we shall then continue, uh, second, with a panel commenting and discussing aspects of the keynote address, uh, the three mentioned dimensions and the involved uh, overall general political uh, aspects. Uh, of the Union's sovereignty. And eventually, uh, third, uh, starting at 11.50, um, uh, until 12.30, our session opens up for questions and comments uh, from you, from the audience, and uh, also uh, from those who are online. So far for my introductory remarks. First part. Keynote address, strategic sovereignty of the Union, realistic chance or wishful thinking. We have the privilege uh, and pleasure to hear uh, the reflections of uh, Dr. Bruno Dupre on this uh, question. Uh, who is Dr. Bruno uh, Dupre? Uh, he is a security and defense advisor to the Secretary General of the European External Action Service. Uh, if nothing has changed in your career in the last, uh, uh, let's say, uh, couple of weeks, uh, EEAS. Um, ah, the external, um, uh, European External Action Service, we are here in the Academy of European Law. In terms of union law, this is Article 27, Paragraph 3, Treaty on European Union, uh, in case uh, uh, you search uh, for the provision. Uh, the service led by the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security uh, Policy, who, as uh, all of you, of course, are aware of, is the President of the Foreign Affairs Council and uh, one of the Vice Presidents of the European Commission uh, uh, in terms of law, it's Article 18, Treaty on European Union. 
and uh, this high representative shall conduct the Union's common foreign and security policy, including the common security and defense uh, policy, in terms of law, Article 18, Paragraph 2, and then all these articles, uh, Article uh, 23 at the Quintus, as well as ensure the consistency of the Union's external action as a whole, uh, in terms of law, Article 18, Paragraph 4, and in particular, uh, uh, those Articles 21 at Sequentis and uh, the Common Commercial Policy uh, and the Attached Policies in uh, the Functioning Treaty. Uh, I was just talking about the High Representative. Uh, uh, not to be confused, uh, Dr. Bruno Dupre is not the High Representative, uh, but uh, for us it is a High Representative uh, of uh, this service. Dr. Dupre has been detached by the French Quai d'Orsay uh, to the EAS uh, since 2013 and mainly focused up to uh, 2017 on security threats, such as, uh, in early times already, pandemics, uh, Ebola, uh, chemical weapons, Syria, drones, targeted uh, killings, nuclear issues, uh, nuclear food bank, and since 2017 on the European defense file. He holds a PhD in law from the uh, European University Institute, Europäisches Hochschule Institute, and a Master of Administration from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And he has also published a novel, Si tu veux une vie, vol la. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Mann der Literatur. Uh, concerning our topic for today, Dr. Dupre has published in January of this year, uh, as you are aware of, before uh, Russia's uh, uh, raid, uh, invasion, uh, has uh, published a policy paper of the Fondation Robert Schumann on, I quote, European sovereignty, strategic autonomy, Europe as a power. What? reality for the European Union and what future. This is just in point for our session, right? It will be most interesting how he sees the question today after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Peter Christian. Thank you to uh, ERA for inviting me. Um, one first thing I'm, uh, I'm talking on, on my behalf here, what I may say is that uh, it may represent, uh, it may not represent the current institution I'm working for or previous ones. Um, next slide, please. So you can relax because we're not going to talk about law. And I won't mention, I think, any article. That may be, uh, that may be my, my first uh, uh, weakness. Uh, but we're going to talk about sovereignty and the current situation. And two days ago, um, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the commission, she was addressing the um, conference of uh, uh, EU ambassadors, the annual conference. And she said, uh, we are facing a tectonic shift. And tectonic shift, um, not only in terms of a political, uh, but also economic and social dimension. And of course, this has consequences for uh, European sovereignty. As we define it, I would say, we will come back to it, the capacity to act and to decide autonomously. And also our territorial integrity. And those two very crucial concepts are faced with increased uncertainties. And it's not clear yet if this is for the worst or if it is for the better. Next slide, please. Before seeing what the EU can do about this, uh, I would like first to address those uncertainties themselves. The first one is, what will be the issue of war in Ukraine? The second one is uh, European unity, 
the world economy, the balance between major powers, the positioning of the global south, and the news <coughs> is chaos good. Next slide, please. <coughs> First uncertainty that will have consequence on us is the issue of the war in Ukraine. I think it's clear that the scenario considered uh, least likely in February, the victory of Ukraine, is no longer impossible. Even if Ukraine has not yet won the war, to some extent, Russia has already lost it. And that's a quotation from the uh, High Representative Joseph Borrell. But a major uncertainty remains, which is, can President Putin accept a defeat? And here, there is a non-negligible risk for Europe and uh, of an uncontrollable escalation on European territory threatening our sovereignty. And we can see that today. The mobilization, is it special, partial or general? Not clear. The nuclear blackmail, the Nord Stream sabotage, European integrity is at stake. Next slide, please. European unity. So far, there has been an incredible, unprecedented degree of European unity and coherence. We are now in the eighth sanction package, 19 billion of support for the economy, for humanitarian issues, for infrastructure, and 3 billion in armament. This is really unprecedented. And Putin thought that, President Putin thought that EU will not dare, will not dare to deliver weapons, will not dare to free itself from the grip of Russian energy dependence. But we did dare. However, the unity that we've been showing, and which is a unique one for the last 50 years, is very fragile. And we can see uh, how much uh, it will be already um, tested, it has been already tested, and it will be tested within the EU. And of course, as you all know, and we may also uh, know it from a personal point of view, the moment of truth will be uh, with the winter, all gas nutrition. And really, the, the devil, and that's what we are looking for uh, at the uh, EAS, is the details of the agreement among us, among member states, and also with third countries. Next slide, please. Now, the, the third uncertainty for, for us is um, that the nature of the world crisis, the world economic crisis, with, we see three cycles solidifying, inflation, stagflation, and recession. But we don't know yet if it is another economic and financial crisis or if it is a more um, uh, structural disconstruction of our approach to capitalism in its current form. But one thing is sure, um, the, the social house, what I will call the, the house of solidarity, is burning, and we are uh, looking elsewhere. Um, and it's clear that Europe has not yet taken, the, um, taken into account the social dimension of strategic autonomy. Where is the social dimension of Europe? I mean, in terms of including growth beyond financial profitability, in terms of measurement of social and environment impact of profits. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to our sovereignty and territorial integrity, one of the major uncertainties, in addition of the other one, is where, where are we into the balance of power between major powers? And we all know that there is a strong alliance uh, emerging between China and Russia, uh, Russia becoming a Euro, uh, um, Eurasian continent. But is this sustainable? And is it our interest to antagonize China, the EU interest to antagonize China? 
uh, by treating it as a mere systemic rival, as some of major powers request from us. And even when it comes to Russia, uh, Russia who is plunging us into horror a little more every day, um, do we want to break off completely the dialogue with Moscow and let Russia drift towards Asia? So to preserve European sovereignty, the question is what could be a balancing act between this, those superpowers for the EU? We will come back to that. Next slide, please. And in fact, there will be a few moments of truth. The first one is the um, 20th Congress of the, um, of the China, China Party, which is coming in, in, a, in, in a few days. And the second one will be uh, not only the midterm in the US, which are coming very soon, but also the elections in 2024, not to mention the, the presidential election in Russia in 2024. Those will be defining moments to know where uh, we are shifting, for the worse or for the better. But one thing is very clear. We stand by Ukraine's side, and if all wars end in a ceasefire and negotiation, it is necessary for Kiev to be able to approach this phase from a position of strength. That's why we are supporting Ukraine with a substantial military aid, 3 billion euros so far by the EU of military equipment. And in fact, I don't want to be too um, uh, grandiloquent, but we really stand by Ukraine also because what is at stake here for us is neither or more or less than the survival of the West. Because President Putin and President Xi are preparing, that's their own word, a post-Western world. This is, of course, uh, reasoning for our own approach of strategic sovereignty and our territorial integrity. Next slide, please. Well, the next uncertainty that has some consequences on our sovereignty is uh, the global south. We use this term to, to mention the countries from the south. They are not all together, but that makes the discourse simpler. We were shocked to see the lack of support from countries of the global south when we had to vote at the uh, UN General Assembly to condemn the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. Forty countries abstained. And actually, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, almost the same continued to abstain, despite uh, an incredible uh, outreach we made during these last six months to make them change. I think only Morocco, uh, who abstained, voted for the resolution. And sometimes those countries, we are, them, we are supporting them for the last 50 years. That raised a lot of questions on our um, development approach. But should we be surprised when we talk to them in the UN or through the uh, EU embassies, they clearly say it's not our war. And they look at the consequences for them, not at the causes. In addition to that, you have all the things that which are coming back, which are merge, intertwine with the uh, issue at stake here, and they are racism, accusation of racism, colonialism, slavery. And we have decided to change our approach, and I will come back to this. Instead of trying to convert people to democracy and to tell them this is you know, you sh where you should go, even should is too much. We have to listen. And this is really new, you know, listening with, without trying to convert for the EU and for many um, EU member states, it is new because that's the only way uh, we can try to see 
how the global south will um, develop itself in the coming years, and if we have a chance that this will support our um, political system. <laughs> but the good news is that, in fact, despite everything, sorry, next slide, please. Despite everything that uh, um, separates us, we share something very strong together, which is the multilateralism. And the reason why the Global South supports multilateralism is that they know that through the UN, they have one vote, whatever their power in the world, whatever their um, um, number of people they have. But the multilateralism, the way it exists today, has to be reformed to a greater extent. Many things do not work anymore. I'm not even talking about the UN Security Council, but I'm also talking about the uh, General Assembly and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the agenda for the development, the sustainable goal development, which is not really working. And we also need to rely more on what we call mini-lateralism, which is G7, G20. And I will explain later how multilateralism and European sovereignty go together. If you have a coin, on one side you have strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, on the other side you have multilateralism. This is the same coin, but we will come back to that later. Next slide, please. So when you look at all of this, um, you could ask yourself, well, what could be the upside of this chaos? I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that it could be for the worst or for the better. Yeah? We could be very close to a tactical nuclear weapon uh, uh, threat. It has already existed. Can it be uh, something more? But we could also go in the other direction. And the other direction is that this means clearly for the Western country that no statu quo is possible anymore. And in fact, um, in many um, academy or university of the world, it's time now to rethink the very concept on which we have been uh, based, basing our uh, um, defense of values, the concept of democracy, of sovereignty, of multilateralism. Everything is on the table. And if it is not on the table, it needs to be on the table because we are not listened to anymore. And it's clear that beyond the war and how it will affect our sovereignty and our territorial integrity, we have challenges ahead that are uh, as important, if not more important. Because when you look at the war from, from uh, an helicopter point of view, it looks like uh, uh, President Putin is uh, ha having a, a war from the 19th century, an imperialistic uh, uh, approach to the war, with the means of the 20th century, uh, tanks. But in fact, this is also part of the future, and we will have to revise the way we, we, we envisage war. But those are not, that's my point of view, the real issue. The real issue is we, are, we need to address four things that will stay for us for a long time. The first one is that the equilibrium of powers is not clear anymore. On one side, you have a kind of bipolarity between China and Russia. On the other side, you have um, a lot of regional powers that now say no to the US. When they have been asked by the EU to vote for them, they said no. But when they are asked by the US bilaterally to say support us, they don't even do it anymore. I'm thinking of the Saudi Arabia recently. I'm thinking of Central Asia countries. Central Asia countries. The, uh, the backyard of China. So we have to take into account this. We cannot rely anymore on grand support. It has to be addressed through multipolarity. 
And that will change our concept of sovereignty. And the third three, you know them. Greater migration flow every day, climate change, and new technologies. I don't want to, to dwell on this. Next slide, please. Well, this time of uncertainty, uh, for better or for worse, is also a time of opportunity for Europe. Opportunity to better assert its capacity to act and decide autonomously, which is the very definition of sovereignty. And you, if you translate that into concrete terms, it means four things. Being less naive, more autonomous, clearer in our values and more effective in our determination not to be the playground of other powers. Let's look at this. Next slide, please. There is a link between being sovereign, politically sovereign, and becoming a geopolitical actor. And this link is moving from dependence to more strategic autonomy. So we have three phases. The phase where na naivety has to be behind us. You know, we, we always talk about the fog of the war, but Europe must get out of the fog of the peace because we are at war economically, financially, commercially, military, and systemically. Our own political system in its crown, in its San Francisco UN Charter, is contested. The West has no longer the monopoly of power, and yet we must be stronger than ever. And it's difficult because on one side, President Putin and President Xi think that we are weak, and on the other side, there is a feeling of fatigue in Europe fighting about many things, including Ukraine support. But as Joseph Borrell, the high representative, said, we cannot afford to be tired. He's 73 and is uh, running the world just to send this message. Next slide, please. To be more um, sovereign, we need to be um, recognizing our vulnerabilities and our dependencies in all sectors. And we will see that after me. You know, not only the military sector, but also the critical sector. Space, energy, digital, transport, health. When President Macron in 2017 in Prague mentioned for the first time European strategic autonomy, um, in all chancellery of the world, including in France, people were, what is he talking about? And when we try at the EU to, um, to, to transform what is said from words to action, there was no whatsoever echo. Not only France was not really supporting because the strategic autonomy thing is a military thing linked to the nuclear dissuasion, and how you could transform such a uh, acronym, European auto uh, strategic autonomy, into a European thing was something that nobody wanted. Neither member states, they saw it as a French way to, uh, to uh, again take over Europe, nor the Commission, nor even the EAS. So it took from 2017 to 2020 to really be able, by a kind of a diplomatic massage, if such a thing exists, uh, to um, to um, apprivoiser um, the, the concept. And we did it. We did it we, with the idea that we need to develop a common culture because European sovereignty is developing a common culture. We did it in 2016 with the global strategy. We did it uh, last year with the strategic compass, which is a livre blanc on security and defense. We did it when Russia invaded Ukraine, because we have never been so united. And all these different dots 
are catalyst for aligning our policies and value. And here I would like to uh, come to the uh, having a narrative. Some people say, why do we need to have a narrative? Be it strategic sovereignty, European sovereignty, strategic autonomy, strategic responsibility. We have changed a lot. We have changed a lot because we are not lawyers. We try to see what is acceptable by the greatest number of European countries when it comes to a narrative. And whatever one of those terms is, it is very important to have one. Because without a narrative, you don't have any political vision. And without political vision, we has, you have no future. So we have shifted from the last four years between these four acronyms. But the question is not so much uh, what is the best one from a political point of view, because it changes every day. But it's also the, always the same idea. On one side, strategic autonomy or European sovereignty means the <coughs> capability to act together, collectively, each time necessary, and individually, each time we need. That's the very defi definition of what we mean by strategic sovereignty. Next slide, please. And of course, we've been accused by many, including in Europe, um, to, to, to try to change the very concept of a liberal market by uh, re-importing inside the EU the idea of fortress Europe, of protectionism, uh, and the French being, you know, en avant um, for, for those concepts. And I just mentioned that, in fact, whatever the concept, the idea is exactly what is written here, acting collectively whenever possible and autonomously when necessary. And for that, we have developed different tools. We, we don't need to develop them now, but maybe after me, uh, you will. Uh, we have developed kind of packages or um, the boîte à outils on military, on economic, on cooperation to make sure that uh, in addition of a narrative, you, have, you are also equipped with regulation, directive. Um, you are also equipped with operational things. I'm thinking of a you know, a military being on the sea and on the oceans. And if you take all these different strands, narrative, regulation, operations, you are not yet a geopolitical actor, but you are on, a way, on your way to become one. And now something which is a bit paradoxical. Uh, when you think about strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, you're thinking yourself, but in fact, um, we see interdependence as a key to strategic autonomy. But what we don't want is um, to be imposed on us, this interdependence. It has to be a choice. That's really a new approach to, to what we do uh, with our partners. And that's true for all our partners, including, including our strategic ones. We don't want to move from one dependence to the other. And when I say that, I'm sure you understand what it means when it comes to energy. Next slide, please. Well, this slide, slide um, this, uh, yes, this almost last slide is about how to define our DNA, how to redefine our DNA, our backbone, our immune system. What is EU good at? Beyond, you know, beyond supporting financially the development of others, which is something we still need to do in a different approach, you know, with including our own interests into the development of others. Before, before we move to this slide, let me tell you about this. Defending our own interests while supporting others. When we wrote the um, strategy on Africa, it was impossible to insert in the strategy, including 
the interest of the EU. This sentence, or this half sentence, was not possible to put, including in the own interest of the EU. It tells you a lot on a, pap on a paper or a strategy that is 20 pages long that you cannot put when you support Africa, including its own interests. We had to intervene at the cab cabinet level to be able to, um, to, to insert such a sentence. It tells you something about the, the, the shift which is needed to become a geopolitical actor. So what is it being a multilateral country, um, identity like the EU? It's not only you know, the classical approach of uh, multilateralism, respect for territorial sovereignty, rule of law, human rights, separation of power. It's also, and that's quite new actually, uh, to refuse la logique des blocs, to refuse the decoupling in which uh, great powers want, would like us uh, to, be, to be loved. And here, it's a very complicated um, thing for the EU to be able to balance uh, the need for strategic autonomy, the need for being supported by uh, the, the, our traditional allies, but at the same time find the right balance so that we are not obliged to decouple from the rest. And the, the, the tension between China and, and the United States, the current tension between China and the United States, um, where the United States is asking us to look at China only as a system, systemic rival is an issue for us. Because for us, not only China is a systemic rival, but it's also a competitor and a partner. And that will be, you know, how the EU will have to define its approach to European sovereignty or strategic sovereignty to be able to say no, to learn how to say no at some point, even to the closest allies, so that we can um, exist by ourselves, define our narrative, and be respected and not just because we are uh, giving checks or uh, support, uh, development support, but also because we have something to say as such as a political identity and a political entity. Merci.